I think you should quit chasing the paycheck and start chasing the passion. I think you should quit craving the approval of others and start defining what you are about. Even though those moments may feel challenging, like the moment is just too big, like you're not enough to handle it, that's not true. You are able to overcome that, but it's going to take effort. And you can achieve anything that you want. The fear of what people think about you, worrying what other people think, negativity, it won't matter. It won't be the main thing that holds you back. You will break through that and you can achieve anything you want. I think you should quit negativity and start having gratitude for whatever stage of life you're currently in and whatever happens to you. I think you should quit caring about what other people think and start living your version of life. I think you should quit being a watered down version of someone else when you can be the full version of who you are. The antidote to haters is confidence. And one of the ways we build confidence is surrounding ourselves with the right people and by having the right mentors who have already succeeded and can help us overcome negative people, mental health challenges, and any adversity that we face. Failure is necessary to be able to improve. Failure is necessary to be able to excel. If you aren't willing to fail, you are not going to succeed. If you love yourself, then you're going to get in the mirror and you're going to face the adversity, face the conflict, embrace rather than avoid challenges. And you don't give up on yourself. Do not give up on yourself. When you find yourself criticizing yourself negatively, comparing yourself to others, try to find inspiration in their successes and strengths instead of feeling threatened. If you don't become obsessed with creating your ideal life, it will slip away. You will lose sight. You can't let that happen. You need to make your life a priority. Even at your darkest time, you're destined for something greater. Let me say that again. Even at your darkest time, you're destined for something greater. Confident people know that your imperfections are what actually allow you to be confident. They will be the determining factor in your ability to feel confident and your ability to have confidence be a part of your life. It is self-compassion that gives us the power to face our failures, to face our fears, to face our insecurities, to face what we don't like about ourselves and come out on top. The bottom line is the world is yours. I don't think confidence is something that you are born with. It's a skill set and I had no confidence. So confidence is something I taught myself over the years. I started becoming okay with who I am. I became the best version of me. And then I sort of said, I'm okay, you know, I'm all right. Even if someone else thinks this, I'm okay. And everyone can do that. People just don't realize it. So it made me understand that confidence truly is the key to getting ahead in life. If you believe in yourself, the world will believe in you. Because perception is reality. As soon as I started doing everything that I loved, there was a surge of power, a surge of confidence. I wasn't insecure anymore because the emotion that had the most dominance in my thought process was actually being paid attention to. I, I'm really sick of being insecure. I believe I'm enough and I believe that everything I have that I need for life to make all my dreams come true, I know it's already inside of me. It's who you are and being comfortable with who you are that influences other people to say, oh, okay, maybe I could do that. You can't wait for destiny. No one can be that. You can't be like, oh, destiny's going to knock on my door one day. No, it won't. You have to be able to recognize opportunities um, because there'll be a lot of them that come into your life. And once you recognize an opportunity, you have to seize the day and work bloody hard because there'll be 25 other people who want to do it. The first step is belief, right? People think the belief comes once you've done it. You won't even take the first step if you don't believe that you can accomplish it. So we lead with belief as a species. So you have to find a way to believe in it to move. So your mom is giving you an awesome challenge. Can you believe in the face of her doubt, right? And to me, when people doubt me, it's a gift. I love that because I believe in beauty and rage. And you need both. I need people to love me. I need to want beautiful things for myself and for others. I want to create something amazing. I want to help a lot of people. I also want to prove a lot of people wrong. 
who don't think that I can do this. I want to crush the enemies that want to see me fail, that want to do anything they can to ensure that I fail. The reason if you fire everybody, you might be the problem is, and I have no idea, but like one of the theories or the things that I've seen is that it means that you're not willing to be accountable. When I fire somebody, earlier I said firing, that was my fault. I hired them. When we lose a client because of the head of strategy or creative or media, that's my fault. I empower them. Once you take on full accountability, life gets awesome. Once you realize everything is your fault and you're in control, you know why everybody's so upset? They think somebody has control over them. I don't give a shit who the mayor, who the governor, who the president is. I'm gonna live. It's real facts. And by the way, if you don't like it, move to Sweden. Like, you're in control. I think that's, you know, my parents, for, you know, and I'm not sure that's a Soviet thing, that was my parents, but I... I, it, I, I believe it is. Uh, it's, uh, they just, you know, all the emotions go out and it's, it's get the job done. And... Yeah, dude, when you have context where like you had to stay in line for bread, for, there are people who complain every day and like just complain but are buying $7 coffees at Starbucks. <laughs> like, do you know how soft you are when you buy $7 coffee? <laughs> I went on one family vacation in my life growing up. I worked every day from 14 years old, every weekend, every single summer day. I have no entitlement. I built a $65 million business for my mom and dad and left at 34 years old with no money because I didn't pay myself anything while I was building it. So when these kids are talking about being sad and want to be somebody, I was 34 years old and built a $65 million business. I built it, right? And I left with nothing and started over at 34. Zero. I started VaynerMedia in the conference room of Buddy Media's company because I had no money to pay for our own rent. I lack entitlement. It's my strength. I took that from them. Dwelling and pondering and crying doesn't do shit and it especially doesn't do shit in this eco chamber. In this arena, there is no crying. You can cry, you're just gonna lose. And I have bad news about complaining and crying. Let me tell you something about complaining and crying that's really, really gonna hurt for all you complainers out there. Nobody gives a shit. And let me give you a preview who gives a shit. The following people give a shit when you complain. The other losers around you, your sick, broken parent that secretly wants to hold you down so that you're not more successful than them. And let me remind you one more time, the other fucking losers around you. We have to start deploying self-awareness. If you leave here and start your process of really knowing what makes you happy, of who are you really, if you could stop chipping away the voices from the outside, if you can start figuring out what you're scared of, if you want to actually do something, even in the light of the picture that I'm painting right now, who are you scared to fail in front of? The reason so many of you are not doing what you want to do is you're scared to fail in some. You're scared that your brother will judge you, your wife, your girlfriend, your husband, and most scary, your mom or your dad. You need to eliminate that and or own that fear and put yourself in a position to succeed. Because with all of this, with all of this, we are now in the greatest era. For the first time ever, with no fucking money, with no goddamn connections, this can put you on the map. If you're good enough, if you are good enough to be up here, to make bling bling, if you are good enough, Nobody's stopping you. Not fucking Donald Trump, not the fucking Russians, nobody. If you're building a small life on what you have, what God has given you, you're made in the likeness and image of God, and you've been given authority and dominion over everything over the face of the earth, you can't build a new life. You can't fit a new life, an expanded life, in a small mind. You have something special. You have greatness in you. Visualize the life that you want to create. Make the commitment, make up your mind to make a radical change in your behavior, knowing you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. Look at your relationships and ask the question, what kind of person am I becoming because of this relationship? What is it doing to me? Am I growing mentally and emotionally and spiritually and financially? 
What is this relationship doing to me? Am I a better person because of this relationship? Does this person hold me accountable to a higher standard? Do this person, what do they bring the best out of me? And you should understand this, that it was always going to be your family and your friends that would be the first ones to try and talk you out of your vision and your big idea. That's why you're supposed to live your life. Focus on your intentions and do your thing. A lot of people put success on this mountaintop and they say, I'll feel successful when I get here, when I make this amount of money, when I find this person, right? And a lot of people don't understand that success is all around them right now that I've decided a long time ago that I didn't want to be another man who lived and died and didn't do anything significant. There's so many of y'all that are running around that are connecting whatever your concept of what life and love and happiness is to this thing that doesn't exist. And so in your mind, you're not living until you get to that. Therefore, becoming is not about arrival, it's about the journey. We're committing to the journey. We're committing to the process. That's good news, because you might be in this room and you might be older in years and you might be thinking to yourself, man, my best days are behind me. Because I believe that, what that tells me is that while I'm becoming, I'm gonna face problems. Our problems do not overshadow our purpose. Our weaknesses do not discount our work, and our deficiencies definitely do not delay our destiny. The lesson of letting go is not only that external events cause us to let go, the way God changes us is transformation from the inside out. Isn't that really relevant while you're stuck inside? You gotta grow, you gotta expand, you gotta know that you're here for a purpose. There are no mistakes. There is a meaning. Even if you haven't found it yet, you must discover it. It first starts with decision on your part. And may I add, well, you should decide. Why let worry continue to take money out of your pocket and bank account? Why let worry any longer keep you from becoming all you can be? Why let it rob you of better friendship, better family relations? better profits, better results. It's a burden you can get rid of. Why not be rid of those thinking, nagging feelings that all is not going to be well, that you can't do it, that it won't work out for the best? Worry is undue concern that takes up too much of your mental and emotional time. And you know what? For most people, they don't discover the meaning of their life until their life is over or until somebody very close to them that they love is about to leave them. You don't have to wait for the pain to discover the meaning. And so although you may believe it to be true about you, these doubts and negative thoughts you have, these were not your original thoughts. That's a powerful thing to understand because you weren't born this way. You weren't born doubting. You were born perfect. You were born believing you were going to do something great. You were born believing you were going to do something special with your life. As a baby, I promise you, you had no negative self-talk. You had no negative self-doubt. These are external sources. They're somebody else's thoughts they gave you because of how they felt about themselves. If you're offering words of wisdom to someone in the genuine attempt to help and they treat that with contempt, then shut up because you're demeaning your words by throwing them away. Self-confidence is self-trust. Self-confidence is building a reputation with yourself. 
that you keep your word to you, that you keep the promises you make to you. Somebody with self-confidence has a reputation with themselves that I do the things I say I'm going to do. And so the cool thing is self-confidence is an internal game. You do not need external accolades, external admiration in order to build self-confidence. You don't need any of those external forces. It's all done internally. You control this. And you control this by beginning today to keep the promises you make to yourself. It's not good enough just to keep the promises you make to yourself. You must acknowledge it when you do it to you to give yourself credit to create confidence momentum. Expect the constituents and the comrades to leave you and desert you after a while. Don't be upset when they don't react to your dream the way you expected them to because they were never really with you in the first place. Success breeds contempt. You'll know you're winning when they start hating you. Because if you're not facing resistance, maybe it's an indication that you're going in the same direction as your enemy. If nobody's hating you over it, it's not big enough. You'll know it's big enough when they start hating you for it. And nothing you do satisfies them. And nothing you do calms them down. That's a sign that you're getting ready to get in a net-breaking blessing. You see, writing about events and circumstances that occur helps you to clarify exactly what is happening. When we describe life to ourselves only in our minds, our imaginations tend to feed false or distorted information about how things are, positive or negative. When we describe a situation in writing, however, we become more factual, more accurate, and certainly more realistic. Then as we reread what we have written, we create a new picture in our minds to replace the distorted picture we have been working with. And once we finally see things as they are, rather than as we think they are, we can then see our way clear to make them better. As you begin to develop the habit of writing down your problems, recording your observations, emotions, and reactions to life's events, you will undoubtedly find yourself both posing and responding to a whole new set of questions about your past, present, and future. Why did I say that? Why does he always make me feel that way? If I follow this course, where will I be five years from now? As you begin to both ask and answer yourself on paper, you will be amazed at the incredible leaps in personal understanding and self-awareness you will experience. And remember, any positive change which occurs within you will ultimately manifest itself in a positive result outside of you, in your social or professional world, your attitude, your bank account, your habits, and even your appearance. Writing in your journal is one of the best ways I know of to develop more effective communication skills. As you become better at describing life to yourself, you will find that you become better at describing yourself to life. Put into more practical terms, as you become better at saying what you really want and how you really feel to yourself, you will be able to better express yourself and your feelings to others. And in return, better able to understand what others are really feeling and really saying to you. Do you define yourself by your emotions? Do you define yourself by your status? Do you define yourself by your lowest point? Do you define yourself by your highest achievement? All of that is dangerous. Because the moment you start believing that you are what you do or you are what you went through, there's a bleeding on the inside that happens when, you're, when your sense of self-worth flows from what you do and what you go through. Write about a current dilemma you are facing. Perhaps it is a personal problem, a business matter, a family issue or a financial problem. Whatever it is, take the time to capture it on paper the way it really is. But remember, writing out the problem is only the first step 
to creative problem solving and effective decision making. The next step is to carefully analyze what you have written. Here are some of the key things to look for. First, exaggerations or distortions of the truth. Are you really telling it like it is? Take another look. Perhaps your concern is making it seem worse than it is, or your enthusiasm is making it seem better than it is. Second, a tendency to blame circumstances or someone else for your problem instead of seeing yourself as the cause. You see, most of our difficulties are the result of either failing to do what we could have done or in doing in haste what we should never have done. Third, a tendency to expect circumstances or still worse, other people to change in order for your problem to be solved. Let me remind you one more time that things get better when you get better. Passive hope never has and never will improve human circumstances. And finally, look closely for weak points in the obstacle where you might attack to bring that obstacle to its knees. It usually doesn't take much more than a few minor adjustments in either our attitude or our action plan to solve a major problem. Essentially, you must learn to view your problems like a scientist who puts tiny organisms on a slide. Examine your circumstances through the lens of the microscope of truth to see their real nature, their real perimeters, and their real composition. And two, as you examine your problem, do as any scientist would do, record your observations. You see, as you continue to refine your statement of the problem, of the way it really is, you will begin to move closer to the solution. And speaking of solutions, be sure to record the ultimate conclusion to your dilemma. If it worked well, then it is worth remembering. And if it didn't work well, as you had hoped it would, then it is even more essential to record the outcome, lest you should find yourself repeating mistakes instead of learning from them. Mistakes in judgment are nothing to be ashamed of. Surely most of our personal growth comes as a result of our errors. But what is truly unforgivable is to make the same mistake twice. Every mistake has its own price tag, but the most costly error anyone can make is an error unlearned and often repeated. If something didn't work, it may be too late to undo the mistake, but it's never too late to make adjustments and revisions in your thinking. As step one for getting used to using your journal then, I would suggest writing down problems that you encounter and recording all the steps you can take or did take to solve them as well as their eventual outcomes. Hi, welcome back to Mind Control. The first way to get focus is to find purpose. The way to find purpose is you must identify what it is that you have to be purposeful in. Right When you are struggling with what to do, who you are, what's your next move, you are in an identity crisis. You are struggling with just who you are. See, you have not discovered who you are. You have to discover who you are in order to move you forward. If no one ever gave you the directions, let me ask you something. When you get up and you get up in the morning, you go get in the car or you walk out your door, you have a destination in mind. If you go outside with no destination, what do you do? You just, you wander around. Once you don't have a destination, you are going to wander around. You cannot get in your car without a destination. Where, did you, where do you drive? So you are in an identity crisis, the same thing I was in. So you have to find your purpose. 
So let me help you with this. If you are in this situation, the solution is the first thing. You have to do the thing that God gave you. You just have to identify your gift. That's the first thing. Until you do that, you can forget it. You'll never find your purpose. You'll never know your mission. You'll never know the reason. So I think we're in identity crisis. I think you have to identify who you are and what your real gift is and pursue the gift. The Bible says your gift will make room for you, put you in the presence of great men. That's what your gift do, that's God. That ain't Steve. I'm telling you what God say. You ain't gotta believe me, it's in your Bible. I'm just telling you the truth. I identified my gift. See, that's why when he says, Steve, you can sing. Whoa, hey, hold up man, and that's not what I do. I've identified my gift. I'm in the joke telling business. Your gift is like a tree trunk. Your gift is the trunk of a tree. On a tree, it has many branches. Now, because my gift is comedy, that's my tree trunk. That's what I was made for, the gift. Your two things, your career is what you paid for. Your calling is what you made for. So God took this tree trunk and made a lot of branches. Comedy made me a movie, a TV star, a radio star, a, I could write books. But then what he made me for was to motivate people to change people's lives by sending me through a process that was so hard for me to overcome. When somebody like you stands up and asks me a question, I know the answer without even thinking because I've been processed. I've been, I've been homeless, so I know exactly what you're feeling. You feel me? Mr. Shove said to me, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indicator of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you have plenty of talent and ability and that you're much smarter than your bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. My question to him was, then why isn't my bank balance bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reason for accomplishing great things. If you had enough reasons, you could do incredible things. You have enough intelligence, but not enough reason. That's the key, if you had enough reason. In my years of study, I've also discovered this. Reasons come first, and answers come second. Life has a strange way of hiding all the answers and disclosing them only to people who have been inspired to look for them, who have reasons to look for them. Put another way, when you know what you want, and you want it badly enough, you will find ways to get it. The answers, the methods, the solution will become evident to you. Hey, what if you had to be rich? Are there any books and tapes on the subject? The answer is yes. There are plenty of good ones. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books or listen to the tape. What drives us to find the answers is necessity. So work on your reasons first, answer second. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? It varies from person to person. I'm sure that if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list of reasons why you want to accomplish great things. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. That's one of the best reasons. My mom this morning knew I wasn't feeling good. She goes, honey, do you need to cancel that talk? I'm like, mom, I can't cancel all these people. It's like, you work so hard. Why does it matter? I go, mom, I'm helping them. She goes, oh, then you need to go. Because they're about service. Okay, so in your life, I'll go a little bit a little bit more here, you guys. In your life, if you combine understanding your mess can be repurposed, understanding I'm just like you, understanding the RAS, understanding changing your identity, understand bending time, you have a shot. Combined with this industry, combined with the information you're getting. But if you don't change your identity, do you know how many people I've had as friends that got wealthy that aren't anymore? More than I have that are still wealthy. Do you know how many friends I have who lost a lot of weight and got in shape and aren't in shape? Anymore? Do you know how many friends I have that had a great relationship and marriage that aren't in that relationship and marriage. Does this sound familiar, Ken? You want to know why? Their internal thermostat doing all that crap back. I ain't going back. I know where I am. I got to change that thermostat. By the way, you change the thermostat for your association. Change the thermostat. By the way, associations read books, follow them on social media, listen to their podcasts, their audios, all that stuff. Subscribe to my podcast. It's on iTunes. Listen to my YouTube. It's all free. I don't take, I make no money. This is work. My podcast costs me about a million dollars. I do it to help you. I'm here today to help you. I was paid to be here today, but it's one of the only things I do to get paid anymore to help I'm here to help. I'm here to change your life. I spent the first 45 years of my life 
building my legacy and my dream, and I want to spend the second half helping other people build theirs. I feel like it's my calling and my mission in my life is to help people. It's sort of my form of ministry. I trickle God in there just a little bit, but not enough to be offensive. I give people the tools, skills, and inspiration to do it. I want to change the world. I want a billion people to change their lives to be a force for good. Let me explain to you why. I think the world is more screwed up and divided than it's ever been in the history of mankind. You're either a Democrat or a liberal or a Republican or a this or a that or black against white. If you In our country right now, evidently, if you're a white male, your enemy are brown people who are coming across our border, right? If that's not your enemy, then if you're a Christian, your enemy is a Muslim. If that's not your enemy, then if you're black, your enemy is white privileged male, right? By the way, really your enemy, if they're a Christian, white privileged, successful, married male, then they're really bad guys, right? And what we do is we enemy each other constantly in this world. We're more divided than we've ever been. People are broke. They're struggling. They want to blame somebody. The bottom line is people don't like their lives. They're not happy with their lives. They're looking for someone to blame. Politicians, Trump and Obama, I don't care who you like, they're both incredible at getting you to subtly blame someone else for your conditions. Those are confidants and every person, not just every leader, every person needs a few confidants in your life with whom you can be transparent and then you won't be so lonely all the time. This man is in cage because there's nobody walking with him. There's nobody who's got his rhythm. There's nobody who's got his pace. And then there are constituents. Constituents. And this is the vast majority. This is the big category of what happened in church. Constituents are distinctly different from confidants. Confidants are for you. Constituents are for what you are for. They line up with the cause. They're called to the cause. They join your church because you feed homeless people. They join your church because of your foreign mission. They join your church because you're going to heaven. They join your church because you believe in faith and you teach the word. They join your church. They are not for you now. They are not for you. They are for what you are for. They're going your way. They are for what you're for. What's the highway we came in on? What's the number? I-5. You're, you're on I-5? They're on I-5. You're going in the same direction. They're going your way. They are for what you are for. They're not for you. And you have to understand that because they're attracted to the direction you're going in. But if they see a car that will get them there quicker, they will leave you because they were never for you. They were for where you were going. And if somebody else can get them there quicker than you, they will hop out of your car and dive into their car and go down the road because they were never attracted to you. They were attracted to your direction. And these are constituents. They are for what you are for. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with that until you mistake a constituent for alphabet. And you have a personal relationship with a public person and you think they are there for you and they were never there for you. They were there for what you were for. And then there are comrades. The third category is comrades. Now, comrades are not for you, and they are not for what you are for. They are just against what you are against. They're comrades. They are attracted to you because you have a common enemy, and they will be with you as long as the fight exists. But when the fight is over, they are gone. It's like the past election. I'm going to be very careful because we get in politics, we'll all fight. But, uh, in, in the past election, when, when when McCain and, and Hillary Clinton got together to attack Obama, McCain and Clinton wouldn't get together about nothing except they were both against Obama. Sometimes people only join you because you have a common enemy. They're comrades. They're with you in the struggle. And in the trenches, they're wearing your uniform. But when the fighting stops, you will be attacked in your own foxhole. If you bring a comrade too close to you, when your comrade gets through shooting at who you're shooting at, they will shoot you because they were never for you and they were never for what you were for. They were just against what you were against. You'd be surprised at the people who fight against stuff. Just all kinds of stuff, abortion, same sex, marriage, all kinds of stuff. They're, they're against the same stuff, but they're not for each other. They join together in the fight. You, as a leader, have to know why people hooked up with you. Because if you misallocate a person into the wrong category, you will be brokenhearted and wounded and end up in the cage because you thought a constituent was a confidant, thought a comrade was a constituent. When the fight was over, they got shot in your own foxhole. And I don't care what you hear about on TV, there is no such thing as friendly fire. A bullet is a bullet. Where in the all fire bulimity did we get friendly fire from? Get closer. Uh, <laughs> friendly fire. There is no friendly fire. You shot me. What is a friendly bullet? A bullet going your hand and saying, I like you. You know?
Woo! You know, what's up with that? Because success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Who's with me on this, right? You make everybody else feel great. I mean, it's a horrible example. I hate it. But we all know an extraordinary spirit that took his own life just recently. Probably lit up more human beings than almost anybody alive when it comes to humor and joy. He made everybody else feel happy but himself. It's sad. You don't want that to be you. If there's any gift he can give besides his joy is the evidence of what you want to move towards. Nobody in this room is going to move towards that. But we do it at a little level. We die a little bit along the way by giving up what we really desire and believe in. And my goal is to make sure to see if we can wake that up. So, and by the way, fulfillment is as unique as our people. Achievement, there's laws, right? You do this, this, this. Money, there are laws. Your body, there's laws. We all have biochemical, special, unique identities, but there's certain fundamentals. If you do them in mass, you're going to be overweight. If you do them differently, you're going to be fit and strong. Same thing with money. But fulfillment is as unique as art. Art is what one person thinks is beautiful, somebody else can think is ugly, and that's perfectly fine. Have you ever gone to an art museum and you see this big red square and they go, $10 million, and you go, you gotta be kidding me. $10 million for the freaking square? I'll draw you a square! But someone else, no, look at the texture, the, the, the taste, the flavor, I can taste the paint from you. They have a different way of being fulfilled, right? So those are the two kind of lessons of life. So this is what I'd like to do to help you with today if you want to play with Number one, let's take a look at what will give you the edge. Who's up for having a competitive edge in anything you do? Say, ah. And it's not BS and it's not positive thinking. It's something you can test because the edge is what's going to get more out of you. Second, I'd like to show you how to create a breakthrough. Who here is an area of your life where there's something you've struggled with for a while and you're sick of struggling with it and you're sick of making excuses and you want to actually change it today? Who's got one of those in your life? Say, ah. If you want to play full out, I can show you that. And the third element really affects the other two and it's really the one that affects business and life and that's the power of engagement. All of these are tied to me. Thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again. Recreating you, and you have the power to do that. You can decide that you're going to change, that you're not going to be a wimp. You can decide that you're going to stand up to life. You can decide that I'm going to live each day as if it were my last. You can, you have the power to make that decision. You can decide I'm going to work on myself and develop myself. I'm going to empower me and all of these things that are happening to me right now. They're just temporary inconveniences. They're not stronger than I am. I'm in charge here. Next thing is separate what you do from who you are. That's what the guilt trap is about. See, a lot of folk won't let you forget what you used to do or what you have done, what mistakes you've made. All of us have made some mistakes in life. All of us have done some things that if we had them to do over again, we wouldn't do it again. There are a lot of things that if I had it to do over again, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done it differently. Well, it didn't happen that way. And that's what you call life. I didn't do it like that. Oh, you don't want me to live that down. How huh? you want to keep on putting that in my face about what I did. Guess what? I'm not interested. That's what I did then. Won't do it today. So you are picking on an innocent man. Hello. So as you're in the process of reinventing your life, write a description of the kind of person that you want to be. What are the things that you must overcome? What qualities about your personality you know that you're going to have to change because those particular characteristics are liabilities to you? What are your assets? What are your strong points? Your identity, your personal worth, the thoughts, concepts, and attitudes and beliefs you hold to be true about yourself are the thermostat of your life. They regulate everything. You have a money thermostat, a relationship thermostat, a fitness thermostat. And what happens in people's lives is they change the external results short term. No one's going to tell you this other than me. They start to change their conditions. I'm reading these books. I'm buying these properties. I've made a little bit of money. And your results begin to exceed. You start getting 85 and 90 degrees of results but you didn't do the work to change your identity you didn't change the thermostat your life is set at and guess what starts to happen i watch it over and over you will thank me for this right here someday soon the results get a little higher they're 85 i closed a deal i made a little money i closed another one i made a little money i got this going i've lost 20 pounds whatever it is the results start to get higher than their set thermostat temperature and guess what you do unconsciously you don't even know you're doing it you turn the air conditioner on of your life and you will 
cool it back down eventually to get it right back where you're comfy. 75 degrees. Same thing happens when it goes bad. You're broke. The water's turned off. The power's turned off. Your car gets repossessed. They dynamite your property. You find a way to turn the heater on and get it back. The key to life is not the knowledge you learn. You have to have that. Knowledge is not power if it's not applied. The key in life is changing that internal thermostat. And if you don't change that, listen to me. It'll seem coincidental. Yeah. Oh. Um, Something happened to the property. Uh, it was a bad rain. Uh, construction costs went up. The market conditions changed. Um, the interest rate went up. No, 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 no. It's not coincidental. It's not. You cooled your life back down because you didn't do the work on who you are. The thing I have in my life is I associate with higher and higher identity people more and more and more in my life. That's what this group does for you. Begin to power of association. The people you associate with heat you up. If ever, any of you that are religious, if you weren't or if you weren't fit, let's say you hung around someone in this room that's super fit and you were out of shape. You can't be around that person constantly and not start to eat differently, start to think differently. If you're a person of faith, and you're around someone who's a high thermostat temperature person of faith, you're around them all the time. You start to behave differently. If you're a man in the room and you start to hang around guys who are true to their wife and love their wife and are faithful to their wife and compliment their wife and hold their wife's hand, they do all that stuff, they date their wife. You can't help but change your thermostat. Same with money. You don't think Sylvester Stallone and Phil Knight and John Elway and Tony Robbins had an impact on me? But most of all, Success is making your life what you want it to be, considering all the possibilities, considering all the examples. What do you want for your life? That is the big question. Remember, success is not a set of standards from our culture, but rather a collection of personal values, clearly defined and ultimately achieved. Success is your better life for you, the design you give it, the dreams you accomplish. Making your life what you want it to be for you, that is success. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met Mr. Shelf, he asked me if he could see my current list of goals. He said, let me see your list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. Maybe that's the best way I can help you right now. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or at home somewhere? I said, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we better start. Then he added, if you don't have a list of your goals, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean that if I had a list of goals, that would change my bank balance? He said, drastically. That day I became a student of how to set goals and sure enough when I learned how my whole life changed my income my bank account my personality my lifestyle my accomplishments so their lifelong dream is to have the restaurant experience but their idea of the restaurant is based by what goes on in the front and then they get hired and now they're working in the back where there's pushing and shoving and you find out who comes late and who you can't depend on and so and so's real anointed but they also are a liar and they get on your nerves and they're egotistical maniac can i be real up in here this morning and they're like shocked and flabbergasted and saying, oh God, I'm going to have to leave this ministry I never thought in the world. Baby, you signed up for the restaurant, but we hired you in the kitchen. And I'm just wondering, have you hired your customers? Because they find those type people sign on and they come on to have these grandiose spiritual extravagances. They want to have this moment. It's like people who move to your church because you were in a conference because they think the conference goes on every Sunday. And then they come back a few Sundays and all them extra people are not there. Israel Houghton is not singing this morning. It's Claire Bell Wilson. And she just a skipping and a singing and she can't sing worth jack, you know? And they say, where is Israel? Israel is gone, baby. <laughs> If you know the road ahead, you have incredible power called anticipation. Anticipation is the ultimate advantage. See, winners, leaders anticipate, losers react. The reason you get beat is you don't know where things are happening, so you're reacting. Reaction is always stressful. And yet so much of our life is predictable if we just were to study it, not be caught up in our day to day. It's predictable the challenges you're gonna have in your relationships or with your kids or with your body or with your job or with your economics or with your mother-in-law or father-in-law. These are predictable.
And if you were to anticipate these things and put a strategy in place, you could take it all out and have the quality of life that you deserve. In business, it's everything. Those that anticipate, those that lead, and then there's those that follow. The followers are the reactionaries. So the more we can anticipate, and you can't anticipate and lead unless you first learn how to lead yourself at a different level. And so I love to have you just see that if you and I can start to take control of our focus and we can start to control the meaning of our lives and make something really that meaning that empowers us, because look, what's wrong is always available, isn't it? There's always an Ebola, a bird flu. There's always something that's going to kill the entire human race tomorrow on TV. And then there's your life. What's wrong is always available and so is what's right. And you have to take control of that focus because otherwise you become the follower and you get to live your life. Even though you're a smart person, we're all smart, but it's easy to get led astray by everybody else's focus, isn't it? And then all of a sudden let them create the meaning for us. And then all of a sudden we're settling for life far less than what we desire or deserve. So my approach is really simple. My approach is to say, let's you and I, just for a few little time we have here, by the way, this to me is a little time, a couple hours, two and a half hours, I guess, at this stage, because um, the kind of minimum length of seminar I do is 50 hours, five zero. And you go, are you kidding me? I don't like to hear myself talk. I like to see people do things so often they build muscle, not just thoughts. And so one of the things I'm gonna ask you to do in a few minutes is we're gonna go from this passive mode that you're in right now into full engagement. Because if you get fully engaged, it's amazing what you can accomplish and do. When you're partially engaged, you get a little bit of result. When you're not, when you're disengaged, we all know what you get, nothing. And we live in a society where most of us are so overwhelmed. There's so much information. We're not, we're not having any problem with information. We're being drowning in information, but we're starving for wisdom. And so we gotta separate it out. And so one way to separate out is I'd like to talk to you about three things that can help you increase your performance and your life. Because what I'm obsessed by and have been for 37 years is what can increase, increase performance for an individual or an organization. But also I'm equally obsessed about what's going to make somebody fulfilled. Because who's had this horrible experience? Who here has ever achieved your goal and then your brain said, is this all there is? Who's had this experience here? Say, I. And that's worse than failing. At least when you fail, your brain can say, I can figure this out and do it again a new way. But when you succeed and you're miserable, you're basically technically screwed.